Um, hi, everyone. So glad you're able to join today. And my name is Cynthia Orms. I just uh, finished a season as the safety engineer, which is kind of occupational safety oversight at the Amundsen Scott Research Station, the U.S.'s uh, research station at the South Pole. I spent 117 days on the ice. I basically arrived back in Jacksonville, Florida about 45, 50 minutes ago. I've just flown back. It's been about a five-day process, and I look forward to answering everybody's questions. Absolutely, and can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you wound up to like live and work in Antarctica? Like, what's the process of of getting that kind of profession? Um, well, I've done environmental health and safety consulting uh, consulting since 1985, so for a very long time. Um, when I was 17. I put together a bucket list at a 4-H conference, and one item on that list was to live and work on all seven continents. And this last October, I checked number seven. And so I have lived and worked on all seven continents now. Um, I was, besides working as a consultant, I've been a university professor for quite a while, and I just retired in May. So I started looking at the opportunity to work there. The National Science Foundation has a contract called the United States Antarctic Program, and I applied under that. In a normal non-COVID year, about uh, 2,000 people will deploy on behalf of the United States to the three research stations, Palmer, McMurdo, and South Pole. This year, it was quite different. We had about um, 550 total between the three stations because most of the science was canceled due to COVID to try to to keep it safe. So there's quite a bit of support staff that helps the scientists because our goal is research there at in, in Antarctica. So I was one of that support staff working on occupational safety. We have some pretty unique science installations at the South Pole and so got to help with those and just had a lot of great opportunities and now I'm back in the States. Very good. And uh, can you explain explain to the kids, I know you were explaining to me earlier about the internet situation down in Antarctica, which I just learned this today, and I thought was one of the coolest facts ever. Well, uh, once you get to Antarctica, your phone doesn't work. It basically becomes a very expensive camera and alarm clock. Uh, there's no cell phone coverage, and they're very limited internet. They have it 24-7 uh, at McMurdo, which is the large logistics space that the U.S operates out of and that's where we land first on the ice before deploying to the South Pole. But at the South Pole we have very limited, because of the location at the bottom of the planet, we have very limited internet. We work with three different satellites. One of those satellites is called Discus and that's the same satellite that the U.S. space, the uh, excuse me, International Space Station uses. And we're always complaining because they actually get to use that satellite and they have 24-7 access to internet and we have about four and a half hours access on that same satellite. So that tells you how remote it is that they could get it in space, but we can't get it at the South Pole. That's such a fun fact. And um, before we go on, I'm going to share some of the photos from uh, Cynthia's uh, Facebook. If you could kind of explain like what we're looking at. Um, are, is it the photos that you see of Antarctica? Yeah. So... Um, that's, that's a really good photo there. And as you go down that road, it's one of the roads we use to exercise and run outside, but it also is the road to the end of the world is what they refer to it. So on the very far end, you see the white item. That's the South Pole telescope. It is the largest telescope owned and operated by the United States. On that same building to the right is a smaller telescope called the bicep. And then the first building to the right that you see is a different uh, telescope called the Bicep Array. So these are some very large telescopes. And then to the left of the white telescope is what's called Ice Cube. And that is the US's neutrino observatory. I'm not scientific enough to really explain what neutrinos are, but it is the largest neutrino observatory in the world. So um, some pretty unique installations um, not pictured there is the NOAA National Oceanic Atmospheric Administrations. Uh, they have an observatory there too, but the South Pole is divided into sectors in terms of science. 
So what you're looking at down this road is called the dark sector. There are no radios allowed there. Um, very limited interaction with, you can't have your phone on there. You can't take pictures down that road, that type of thing, because they are listening and taking observations uh, throughout the world. And so that's considered the dark sector. To the right of that, which you can't see where the other observatory is, is called the clean air sector. The cleanest air in the world exists at the South Pole. So that's what NOAA's looking at um, in terms of, you know, what keeps our air clean, what contaminates our air, and they do various scientific observations. We also have the downwind sector. So in the downwind sector, they release balloons to measure ozone. And then we have the quiet sector, which is eight kilometers from the station and they have seismic instruments very deep in the earth and they can register any earthquake that ha happens. They can register the International Test Ban Treaty has a, a seismic vault there and they can register whether anybody or any country releases a nuclear weapon, whether it's testing it in the water, in the air or underground, they could actually pick up those seismic um, changes there. So that kind of divides how the South Pole sector is set up. And that's just one, you're looking at the dark sector there. So we'll uh, check, I mean, that's, that's, do you notice, is there, is there much of a difference when you're breathing in the air down there versus the air every, anywhere else on the planet? Is it much cleaner? Well, it is, it is measurably and scientifically determined to be the cleanest um, air. That's the station that you're looking at. Um, it's actually somewhat difficult to breathe there because you're at an altitude of 9,300 uh, feet above sea level, but because of the atmospheric pressure um, towards the equator, it's usually about 10,500 is how it feels. So when you first get there, you actually really struggle to breathe. I had problems breathing while running outside. Um, and then again, you're breathing air that's, when I left the other day, it was negative 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so it is a little bit difficult to breathe, one, for the temperature, and two, because of the um, altitude. And you go from zero um, feet above sea level to 9,300 feet in about a four and a half hour plane ride. So that's a, quite a shock to your system. If you think normally if you're climbing up Mount Everest, you go up a certain number of feet above sea level, and then you rest and let your body acclimate for two or three days, and then you do it again. Um, in this case, in four and a half hours, we went from zero to 9,300. But and, to tell you a little you, bit about, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to ask, you had, you took this this photo here, right? Yes, I did. And that is that is the South Pole right there, right? So this is the ceremonial South Pole. That's the station in the background. That is the third station that the U.S. has um, put there since 1956. So um, the flags, this is the ceremonial South Pole, so it stays put and uh, the flags surrounding it are the countries that signed the initial Antarctic Treaty. And as you can see, the United States is there. Now there's another, you might be able to find the picture that has the geographic South Pole. And what happens is, so Antarctica is a continent, but the South Pole sits on an ice sheet and that ice sheet is 9,000 feet thick. So, the station, that ice sheet shifts approximately 33 feet every year. And so you don't ever actually touch ground or see dirt. There's obviously no plants or animals at the South Pole. So that shifting ice sheet, because it shifts 33 feet every year, approximately, then the geographical technical South Pole shifts as well. So every year on the 1st um, of January, we take a new GPS reading and we change the geographical South Pole to the actual location. So in reality, the station is shifting away from the geographical South Pole every year because it is on that ice sheet. That is super interesting. I never knew about that uh, regarding the geography of the South Pole and Antarctica. What kind of animal is this? Okay, so this is, this is a seal. And this is at McMurdo Station. There are no animals or birds or anything at South Pole Station because there's no, war, no water. Um, so this is just a seal. They come in early in the season. So this was um, early November. 
and they start to calve or have babies. So you probably see other pictures um, that I've posted of the babies. Okay, and again, this is at South Pole. South Pole, you know, has nothing growing there. It has no water. So therefore there are no animals there. There's no birds or anything like that because there's no way for them um, to eat or drink. So it is just a massive flat ice sheet as far as the eye can see. But at McMurdo Station, which is the larger station, it is on the coast. And then Palmer also, which is our third research station, is actually above the Antarctic Circle. So um, they have different type of weather patterns. And one thing um, that you might not know about the South Pole is it only has one sunset and one sunrise every year. So it either has 24 hours of darkness for six months or 24 hours of light. While I was there, it's just 24 hours of light. So the sun never goes down. There's no nighttime. And um, the sun will set around March 20th, 21st, and it will be dark until basically September 21st. You'll see a little bit uh, lessening or brightening depending on which time of the year. And of course, it's in the Southern Hemisphere, so the um, seasons are reversed. So I just came out of what they call Austral summer season, which of course in the Northern Hemisphere was during your winter season. But I only had 24 hours of daylight there and 24 hours of daylight. I never saw darkness until I got off the ice. We landed in Christchurch, New Zealand, which is the uh, you know, forward operating base for us to deploy from. Last Thursday night when we stepped off the US Air Force C-17, it was complete darkness. And it was just shocking to all of us because we'd been in, we'd seen no darkness for over a hundred days. That, that would drive me nuts. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if the students heard that correctly. Daytime, 24 hours a day, half the year. Nighttime, the other half the year, 24 hours a day. That, I have a pretty interesting question from uh, some of our students. We have a few of them. Is that okay if we ask them? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, here's Sophia. She had an awesome question uh, that I was kind of, I was thinking about myself, but um, you can go ahead and unmute. All right, maybe not. Uh, okay, okay, there you are, there you are. Uh, yeah, my question was, what do you do in your free time in Antarctica? Because, you know, it's always, there's always light or they're always dark. So, and you don't have connection on the internet. So what did you do? Um, we have a lot of different activities going on. Obviously, at South Pole, there's not much to do. You, you don't do a whole lot outside because of the temperatures. Summer, you know, is not as bad, certainly, as winter. But we have, um, we play pickleball, we play volleyball, we have a full-size gym, we have a workout gym. So a lot of people do that. We, uh, we had a ukulele orchestra. We have a couple open mic nights. Uh, we have a science lecture once a week because we have some pretty intense science projects going on to so teach us about what's going on there. Uh, we have movie night, we have sci-fi night, we have three Dungeon and Dragon groups going on. So there's always something to do every night. Now at South Pole, um, you guys are, are young, but there is not a bar. At McMurdo, which is a much bigger station, it can have as much as 1,500 people there. They have coffee houses and bars and things like that. So they have a little bit of different activities, but it's a much larger group. The group this summer was 62 people. So it's a pretty small station at that time. It can go up to 150 during a non-COVID year, but there's always something that you can do. Um, there's also, uh, there are reading rooms. So if you didn't bring your books, there's a thousand books. There's also, um, probably 500 different TV shows on uh, CDs and probably close to 2000 movies. So you could also watch movies in your room or in some of the lounges, that type of thing. So there's plenty to do. That is, it's almost like a little city. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Marcos, you, you had a, a, a pretty interesting question. Go ahead and ask pal. Yeah, so my question is uh, regarding pollution. Um, have you noticed any change in Antarctica that has been caused by global warming or climate change? Uh, definitely. One of the problems we had directly 
they're certainly studying that as well. But one of the problems we had is the C-17 is the largest aircraft flown by the United States Air Force. And uh, for a period of time, we could not get C-17s in because we use a ICE runway. So the C-17 has to land on ICE. And because of global warming, every year, the period of time in which that C-17 can take off and land, um, it keeps shortening. Uh, because of the size of the aircraft and because it's melting. They had a very warm summer there for them. Like when we got there, we left South Pole on Wednesday. It was negative 65. When we got to McMurdo, which is about 900 miles away on the continent, it was 18 degrees. So again, that's Fahrenheit, but that's a considerable difference. Um, also, the um, animals are coming in um, much quicker to have babies. So it's kind of changing the seasons for that. And the ice is melting uh, much quicker. So the sea around McMurdo is normally um, completely frozen over until late December when it starts to break up a little bit. And this season it broke up almost by mid-December, so a good two weeks earlier. So they are seeing a considerable um, difference uh, in how the ice is reacting. On the other side of the continent, they have very large um, icebergs and those icebergs where they break apart they're called calving like a cow calves and they are seeing a lot more of that happening and so that's going to clearly raise the sea levels worldwide when is as that continues to happen so a good portion of our sci scientific research on the continent not just at south pole is relating to climate change so not only measuring the air, the ice, uh, sea levels, things like that. So we are seeing just everyday differences like the, like the runway, but they're seeing other differences as well in terms of the animals migrating, um, when they're having babies, that type of thing. Sure, we had um, uh, some of the kids, they had questions about your day-to-day -day job um, as a safety engineer, but there were also some uh, COVID related questions. Alice, um, trying to unmute you here, pal. There you go, go ahead and ask your question. Um, uh, how, how has COVID affected your job? Uh, well, the deployment this year was, was really different. First of all, they um, canceled the majority of the science that was taking place because uh, the deployment was much greater, uh, much greater period of time. So only permanent scientific installations had people manning them. The year-to-year uh, -year science where people apply for a grant, none of that happened this year, probably will not happen next year. But it really changed how we deploy. So normally you just fly from California to New Zealand, you catch a, get a, a U.S. Air Force a plane to McMurdo, and it's about a three or four day process. Well, because of COVID and that they want to keep the National Science Foundation, which runs our research stations, um, they want to keep COVID off the continent. So what happened this year is in six different groups, I was in cohort three. So you would fly to San Francisco, you would be in managed isolation, which is basically locked down in a hotel without contact. Your food is brought to your room. We were there for five days and we had a COVID test. So when it, everybody who came back with a negative COVID test, then got on a chartered plane from the United States to Christchurch, New Zealand, where we went into managed isolation under the New Zealand Defense Forces into a hotel. Again, we were locked down for 16 days. We had three COVID tests. That was to ensure that we were not going to bring COVID to the continent. We then went to another hotel. We were not allowed to freely walk around to be in the public in New Zealand, we stayed in that hotel till our plane was ready to leave. We caught the US Air Force uh, plane to the continent. And every time a new group arrives on continent, everybody starts at McMurdo. Uh, we are in what we call level yellow for seven days. So we have to wear masks, social distancing. We can't sit next to people at the table. We can't have people in our rooms. Um, we have to distance ourselves in our office. So that was quite different um, than what they've experienced in the past. And then on the way back, which I just started the process, we had to stop in New Zealand, of course, and we had to get another COVID test because now the U.S. does not allow anybody to enter without a COVID test that has to be less than three days old. 
So it not only changed how many people, we would normally have 150 people at South Pole, we had 62. McMurdo would have about 1,300 to 1,500, they had about 450. So it greatly reduced the numbers, but how we deployed changed considerably as well. And obviously that's a very costly way to do that. So um, some of the kids, I've, I've, been, I've got a couple of questions about this. They want to know, um, because they're interested in becoming safety engineers, what kind of courses would you recommend that they, they take? Okay, well, um, one thing I would say is there are lots of different jobs at South Pole. So everything from the dishwasher to safety engineers uh, to equipment operators, there are recreational leaders, there are people who just teach you how to ride a snowmobile. So lots of different jobs that you can look for, but in my, in my case, um, I do environmental health and safety consulting. I have three college degrees. Um, I'm actually an attorney by trade and also a professor. So the type of courses I took in college weren't necessarily related to safety, but I started working in the environmental and safety field a long time ago. And I studied environmental law while I was in law school. So um, if you just want to do safety, because I went about it in a little bit different way, there are, this is considered occupational safety. So you're looking at how people work and keeping them safe. Because this is a U.S. installation, we apply U.S. regulations such as OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health Act. So, but if you're, let's say, going to college, you can um, actually major in occupational safety. They, that was not a thing when I was going through college. Or you can actually take classes after you get out of college and get certifications like a certified safety professional. I also do environmental permitting type work, but I was not doing that um, at South Pole. But keep in mind that 75% of the people at South Pole are supporting the science. So if you don't happen to want to be a scientist, like a physicist or something like that, uh, there are plenty of jobs there. We had people, their youngest person has been 18. Our youngest person was 22 and our oldest person was 71. So there is a range of people there and they, some of them, we had plumbers and carpenters. We had satellite communication, network engineers, IT, safety, uh, people who handled hazardous waste. So there are lots of different jobs available through the National Science Foundation, or if some of you are from different countries, there are about 60 operating stations uh, with about 22 different countries that operate in Antarctica. So even your own countries um, uh, will have stations there that you can support. McMurdo is the biggest station um, operating for any country, and that is the U.S. station. We operate along with, um, we partner with New Zealand and Australia and Italy. So we share resources amongst those three countries in, in the United States. We have a lot of students here in Italy. And so I saw a lot of faces just light up um, on the gallery view. So we'll, we'll go with the final question because I know you're exhausted from all your travel. Um, Mev, you can ask the final question. One of the things that we teach the kids is always follow your passions when you're kind of deciding what you want to do uh, with your professional life. So Mev, go ahead and ask your question. Hello, nice to meet you, Cynthia. <laughs> um, the human generation has always wondered if work can be related to happiness, especially now that you are in Antarctica. Are you happy when you work? Uh, very much so. This is something, a goal I set for myself when I was 17, so probably around the age of some of you, that I wanted to live and work on all seven continents, and this was the seventh continent, and I got to do something that I'm passionate about, occupational safety and uh, environmental um, sustainability are two passions of mine, and I got to go to Antarctica and not only put it into play, but knock off you know, checklist, something on my bucket list. And um, also, you know, set an example for my own kids. My kids are 21 and 23 and they were very supportive. I waited until they were at a period of time that, you know, I felt that they were responsible enough that, you know, if I left the continent, it wasn't um, that big of a thing. But I definitely would say, uh, follow your passions. You know, sometimes your passion is not where most of the money is. But if you're happy at what you do, how much money you're making is somewhat immaterial. It becomes immaterial. 
So I would definitely say uh, go, go after what you enjoy, what you love, and somehow you will find the job that works for you.